This may be the most important and meta video I ever create. More on that in a moment. Today we're talking psychedelics. If you thought Tesla was disrupting the automotive industry, you ain't seen nothing yet. Psychedelic therapeutics will completely disrupt the pharmaceutical industry in one of the biggest disruptions in history. This video focuses on psychedelic therapeutics and the investment case for what will soon be a booming multi-billion dollar market. And yes, I can already sense a few sphincters contracting at the very mention of psychedelics. If that's you, it's especially important to stick around. We'll be looking through some highlights from an epic, and I mean epic, article from none other than ARK Invest on the enormous disruption already underway with psychedelic therapeutics, ARK's financial predictions of the future market size, and most important of all, the significant, unmatched potential for these therapies to reduce or end suffering for literally hundreds of millions of people. Oh, is that all? The purpose of today's video is to educate and inform, not to promote, not to glorify, not to coerce, just to share some information, some research about the potential market size for psychedelic therapeutics, and along the way I will share a few personal anecdotes as they are highly relevant. Now, I told you guys this video would be very meta, and this is the first of many examples. The reason I've just mentioned this explicitly is because every time, every fucking time I bring up psychedelics, for some strange reason, the human being who manually reviews my video decides that I'm glorifying or encouraging their use. I'm having a quick look at YouTube's monetization policy, because this is kind of important. If you happen to notice few or no ads running on this video, well, you can figure out what's happened from here. According to YouTube, I can turn ads on for content if it has recreational drugs and drug related content, if it's educational, bing, that would be this video. Humorous, well, like I might throw in a few really dumb jokes as well, you never know, so tick tick. And clearly the intent here is not to promote or glorify illegal drug use. Again, I'm just sharing research, analysis, data, and some personal anecdotes. And I wanna be really clear, I think most people should stay the hell away from these things, once again, this video contains educational content about drugs. The intent is not to promote or glorify their use. However, given the hangover from the 1970s war on drugs, it's still extremely likely that this video will get demonetized because some human being has a stick up their ass and freaks out about the very mention of psychedelics or the fact that somebody may share some anecdotes from his own personal experience in which he doesn't flat out demonize these things. Now, for those of you who are unaware, brands on YouTube actually need to opt in to be willing to run ads on content relating to recreational drug use. And unfortunately that includes psychedelics, cocaine, methamphetamine, and just about anything else because they're all just one thing, right? Drugs, illegal drugs, because we said so and therefore they're all the same. This just goes to show you the stigma that still hangs over these substances. 50 years after the war on drugs, half a century later, most advertisers still too fucking scared to run ads on content that even mention this stuff. I told you this was meta. So there's a very high chance I'll be making this video for free. Of course, I don't make videos because I need the money. I make videos because I want to share my thoughts and opinions on things that I personally believe really matter. This is a great example. I already know very few people who typically watch videos on this channel are gonna even bother clicking on this one. I'm spending a huge amount of time and I know I won't reach a huge audience, but I know that those who do have an open mind and or are curious about this stuff, not only might learn a few things in terms of the investment opportunity, but far more importantly, as I mentioned, the potential positive impact psychedelic therapeutics can have on people in the future. Just a few final very important things before we dive into ARK's research. Now, I told you guys this video was gonna get rather meta. Well, I don't think you realize just how meta we're about to go. There would be no solving the money problem without psychedelics. In particular, dimethyltryptamine, DMT, found in the ayahuasca brew. The concept for this channel originated during a ceremony deep in the jungles of Peru. I was trying to figure out, now that I'd solved the money problem, what should I do professionally? My goal, how can I have the biggest positive impact on the most number of people? I'm not kidding, the entire concept for this channel came to me during one of my four ayahuasca ceremonies. I'd been stuck for a year and a half trying to figure out what now, what now, what can I do, how can I reach the most number of people? And it dawned on me, tell them about the opportunity in Tesla, people are not getting it. Do this via YouTube, you can reach a lot of people, even if nobody pays attention, at least you tried. The entire reason for participating in those ceremonies is that I was stuck and I've found in the past for my own personal experience, when I've tried every other possible way of solving a problem, coming up with a solution, gaining an insight, getting some clarity, if I'm absolutely stuck, psychedelics can often help me see things from a new perspective, 
gain an enormous amount of clarity and that was exactly the case in my ayahuasca ceremonies. However, the reason for participating in these ceremonies was to figure out where to from here. What I wasn't expecting, my very first ayahuasca ceremony, one of the least pleasant physical experiences of my entire life, in fact, probably the most unpleasant experience of my entire life. As a result of that first ceremony, again, just trying to figure out where to from here, I immediately, and so far permanently, gave up alcohol. I want to be really clear here, I wasn't trying to quit drinking. I didn't go to the jungles of Peru and participate in an ayahuasca ceremony because I was a raging alcoholic who really thought, oh my god, I'm going to die if I don't... No, that was not the case. However, I was drinking a lot. I was dating a lot. Two and two tended to go hand in hand. What's a guy to do when he's backpacking through South America? But since that first ayahuasca ceremony, nearly four years ago, I haven't had a single drink. I just can't even stand the idea of alcohol. This was not planned, but it happened. This alone gave me pause. Huh, there's really something in this. I immediately quit drinking, stone cold, without any struggles as a result of this ceremony. And I wasn't even trying to quit drinking. Hmm, interesting. Now, as I mentioned, no ayahuasca, no solving the money problem. Can anyone recall the very first video I ever posted on this channel? I sure can. It was no accident. If we sort my videos from oldest to newest, we'll discover the very first video on the entire channel called Solving the Money Problem was about psychedelics. Huh? Elon Musk's psychedelic secret. If you haven't seen that video, go check it out. Elon has since effectively come out of the closet in terms of psychedelics. Once again, one of my earlier predictions. Nail on the fucking head. Furthermore, very few people have ever noticed this, but I've been leaving clues from day one. Notice the channel banner here. Let's zoom in. You might notice something interesting. Now, if you have a monitor with extremely poor contrast, you won't see anything at all. But in that space between the logo and my head, there seems to be a face. A strange looking face. What is that face? That's a shaman leading an ayahuasca ceremony. It's been there from day fucking one. Never forget your roots. Of course, none of this will be news to my Patreon supporters. In fact, I've tagged over 34 individual videos where I discuss psychedelics, my own experience, the research in terms of PTSD, addiction, trauma as therapies and so on. This is a topic very close to my heart. In fact, after Tesla, which is obviously number one, on my Patreon page, psychedelics are the second most common topic I discuss. If you're curious, by the way, if you're on Patreon or you want to join, you can actually search by tags and see every individual post tagged as psychedelics. If you're not already a member, you can join using the card in the corner or the link at the pinned comment. Just when you thought things couldn't get any more meta, they're about to. For those who aren't aware, I have a long-term goal and overarching life's mission of having a significant positive impact on as many people as possible. At this point in time, I've got time, but not so much money. Therefore, sharing my thoughts and ideas on a leveraged platform like YouTube, doing the best that I can with the available resources. However, there is a reason I'm investing aggressively. I have a long-term goal of doing capital-intensive philanthropy. You may not be aware of this, but today I live on significantly less than 10% of my income. That's right, the other 90 plus percent, all destined for future philanthropy. Can you see where this is going? At this point in time, the most likely target of my snowball of capital in the future, psychedelics. In particular, helping to forward research and then the rollout of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. Maybe even the creation of new psychedelic substances. Again, the primary focus of helping to reduce and end suffering for as many people as possible. You may have noticed I monetize the absolute f out of my YouTube videos. Ads every two seconds. Constantly plugging Patreon and merch, but I don't need the money. Of course, I do this at great risk to my reputation. I know there's many people that assume this greedy motherfucker. Can't believe he's promoting this stuff so much. He's got enough money. What an asshole. F this guy. Of course, I rarely pay too much attention to the bottom 1%. However, I am aware I do have a great deal of self-awareness. I know how I'm perceived by a certain segment of the audience. And it doesn't bother me in the slightest. Because I know all of this money, every additional cent, every additional dollar, which I'm going to snowball and invest, will ultimately go to doing good in the world. P.S. I do highly encourage you to join Patreon or pick up some merch with the links in the pinned comment. However, if you are a longer term viewer of the channel or a Patreon supporter, you'll have heard about these plans from day one. I have more than enough money to meet my needs, but that doesn't stop me accumulating more. The reason I'm still so hungry is because I have a vision in my mind of being able to do a lot of capital intensive good in the future. And I believe at this point in time, the most likely place that that money goes, at least a large portion, is toward these psychedelic therapies because I don't believe the business case is going to be compelling enough to get sufficient investment. And if for any reason I fall short of my goal of living till at least 130 years old, maybe even I drop dead tomorrow, the good news is maps.org, we'll learn more about those later in this article, Reading Arc's research, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies is the sole beneficiary of every single one of my shares of Tesla stock. That's right, my will 
unchanged for almost a decade now. Maps.org gets just about everything. For the record, my family, even distribution of my real estate, which makes up a small portion of my net worth, everything else, which is basically all Tesla stock, straight to maps.org. So if for any reason I stop posting daily videos and you hear about a decent sized donation to maps, that was probably me. And now with that very important and extremely long-winded intro out of the way, it's time to get into ARK Invest research around psychedelic therapeutics. Well, after a brief 15 second plug to accumulate more capital for future philanthropy. And before we get into it, if you want to instantly unlock over 100 exclusive videos, plus my 10 year Tesla stock price targets and loads of other perks, including optional access to my Tesla valuation model, join our growing community of thousands of supporters on Patreon with the link in the pinned comment. You can also pick up some Tesla, Elon and investment themed merch in the merch store. How far out are psychedelic therapeutics? Published on August 31st by ARK Invest. As always, there's a link in the description of the full article. I'm just running through some highlights here. So if you really want to look at all the numbers, the research, the studies, the science, and the estimates, check out the link in the description. We'll move through this as fast as we can. Used recreationally, medicinally, or ritually, psychedelic drugs seem to have been ubiquitous throughout human history. This may come as a surprise to many people watching, but it is true. And again, I don't make shit up, I don't talk out of my ass. There are references to this. Just about every culture you look, we find evidence of ritual psychedelic use in the past. Unfortunately, during the Vietnam era, psychedelics fell into the hippie and counterculture movements and lost political support in the United States. And <laughs> that is a massive understatement. This ideological opposition may have led to the funding restrictions outlined in the 1970 Controlled Substances Act, a major regulatory setback for research on psychedelic compounds. To be honest, one of the greatest tragedies in recent history. No exaggeration, this is fucked up. The war on drugs, the lingering after effects still today. So many people out there have an allergic reaction to the term drug and they lump everything together in the same category. Somebody decided it's illegal, therefore it's bad. They're all the same. As I mentioned in the intro, many people, their sphincters begin to contract when they hear the word psychedelic. These are the very people who are still experiencing lingering after effects of this ridiculous anti-science Controlled Substances Act. More on that in a moment. Since then, the field of psychedelic neuroscience and pharmacology has been struggling to break free from those repressed and criminalized cultural elements. In the past three decades, however, a growing community of rigorous academics and physicians has re-accelerated research on psychedelics. By the way, special shout out again to maps.org I mentioned earlier, primary beneficiary of my will. Without Rick Doblin and maps.org, we probably wouldn't even be having this conversation. We can see here psychedelic publications over time. Notice from 1950 to 1970, a huge, almost vertical trend going from no papers to almost 1,000 papers per year. Then out of nowhere, bang, Controlled Substances Act, the research died in the fucking ass. I think that's an Australian expression for completely stopped. Only recently, in fact, it wasn't until about 2014 where we reached the previous peak levels of research into these substances at 1970 before the war on drugs fucked everything. We may have lost 40, 50 years of progress, but things are back on track, thank fuck. By the time the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, that would be maps.org, who I referred to previously, was established in 1986. And by the way, just wanna put this on the record, the two most valuable humans, the two most important human beings alive on earth today, in my opinion, unquestionably, Elon Musk and Rick Doblin, who founded maps.org. Research on the therapeutic potential of psychedelics had resumed. Again, without Rick and maps, we would not be having this conversation. By the way, guys, any of these slides without any highlights, I'm gonna skip right over, but I do recommend if you really wanna soak it up, you can pause the video and read through all of the details. In the interest of time, I'm gonna skip ahead a few of these. I know a lot of people will fall asleep otherwise. This is a fascinating graphic to look at. I do recommend everyone soak this one up. We're looking at some of the milestones in terms of psychedelic research and breakthroughs from 1950 to 2022 and the psychedelic winter from 1970 until let's call it the early 90s. In 2018, some states began decriminalizing psychedelics after the FDA designated the psychedelics psilocybin and MDMA as breakthrough therapies. This was a hugely important moment, ladies and gentlemen. In fact, this was a watershed moment today. Many public and private companies are attempting to convince the FDA to approve various psychedelics or psychedelic derivative drugs. The very fact that anyone is needing to convince the FDA just makes me so sad. On the flip side, I'm very hopeful that people are actually making the effort. Again, this is all just a hangover from the ridiculous war on drugs. Now this is stunningly important. We're gonna run through this one in detail. Target indication frequency among public psychedelic companies. In other words, what illnesses, disorders, and challenges are public psychedelic companies attempting to solve and alleviate. We've got neurodegenerative disorders, 
Fragile X, autism, obesity, HSDD, hypoactive sexual desire disorder, addiction, traumatic brain injury and stroke, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, migraine and pain, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, and look at this massive, massive bar down the bottom, anxiety and depression, an enormous cause of suffering for countless humans globally. In ARC's view, conservatively, the combined sales of these therapies could reach $5.5 billion per year by 2030. What we're looking at here is aggregate maturity of clinical trials involving psychedelics. I'm not going to go through all the detail here, but for those who don't know, from concept to approved therapy, you must go through multiple stages of clinical trials, phase one, two, and three. You'll note today very few phase three clinical trials happening yet. The wall of progress indicates this will change very soon. Phase three is the final stage before being approved. In this article, we review psychedelic neurochemistry and explore the current clinical work on psychedelics. We then assess the investment risks and opportunities associated with this pharmaceutical subsector. Our goal is to describe the type of innovation that we believe will play a crucial role in unlocking the potential of these compounds to improve human health. Again, a few super nerdy slides here. I do recommend pausing it if you really want to get into the weeds. It's important, but I know most people will fall asleep. So let's move through these relatively quickly. Just one quick note here. Companies investigating KOR agonists like Salvinorin A, I believe also sometimes known as salvia, could be wrong on that, and ibogaine, typically are targeting addiction. Oh, is that all? Alcoholism. Oh, is that all? And opioid use disorder. Oh, is that all? You'll notice a recurring theme throughout this article. The breadth of the potential issues, disorders like addiction, alcoholism, and so on, that these compounds are showing promise in is stunning and unmatched in the pharmaceutical world. We're now looking at a few different psychotropic, AKA psychedelic substances and their target indications. In other words, things that they are being targeted to help with. Up the top here, DMT, AKA dimethyltryptamine. Shout out to the machine elves. DMT is what's in the ayahuasca brew as well. We've got treatment resistant depression, Alzheimer's and addiction. Mescaline being targeted for inflammation. MDMA targets autism and PTSD. And by the way, in particular with PTSD, MDMA showing absolutely phenomenal potential. Psilocin, AKA psilocybin, AKA the stuff that's in magic mushrooms. Depression, fragile X syndrome, PTSD. Salvinorin A, depression and addiction. Ibogaine, addiction. Special note on Ibogaine, by the way, I'm not an expert. There are potentially some serious health consequences with Ibogaine in very rare cases in terms of cardiovascular events. This may mean there's a few more roadblocks and obstacles for this becoming a legal therapy. Time will tell. LSD, something I personally have extensive experience with. Anxiety, addiction, migraine, and ketamine, depression, and Parkinson's. Now just a quick overview of different substances and their subjective effects in terms of the timeline and also dependence liability. DMT, subjective effects, 30 minute intense hallucination. Just a caveat there, this is true if smoked. However, DMT ingested in the ayahuasca brew, you're talking many hours of extremely intense hallucination and total time dilation, meaning the idea of hours or minutes becomes completely irrelevant. At least in my experience, multiple eternities. Mescaline, a four to eight hour hallucination. MDMA, four to six hours of stimulated, euphoric, and intactogenic experience with very mild hallucination. Psilocybin, four to six hour hallucination. LSD, six to 15 hour hallucination. Ketamine, around one hour of euphoria and sedation. And all of these with very low dependence liability except MDMA moderate and ketamine moderate. Another slide for the nerds to check. We're gonna move forward. Another one as well. If you guys wanna check this out in particular, very fascinating TED talk. And this is stunning. For those of you who've taken psychedelics, you'll see some similarities. Google actually created this crazy video, the Deep Dream VR AI driven hallucination machine. It's crazy. Look it up on YouTube, you'll find this video. Again, if you've taken psychedelics, you'll understand what's going on here. To appreciate the two-way street of perception and how the mind can fill information gaps to present a conscious mind with a working model of reality, consider images such as the rotating snakes we're about to see on the next slide. This static image causes something known as the peripheral drift illusion by producing a signal that tricks part of the brain responsible for motion perception. Many of you will have seen this. It's absolutely bananas. I hope this comes through on YouTube with the compression. If not, look this one up. It's incredible. Nothing's moving on this screen. Your mind thinks things are moving. It's overlaying its own perceptions and assumptions onto reality. And you see movement where there is none. Again, somebody who's ever taken a reasonable dose of say psilocybin or LSD may have noticed this exact thing happening when they look at, for example, foliage or clouds or the grass, or literally anything. Your brain thinks there's movement where there is none, and you get the sense of stuff moving, even though 
nothing is actually moving whatsoever. Several studies offer evidence that the consumption of classical hallucinogens like psilocybin can result in durable psychotherapeutic benefit. Key word here being durable. Many people, and many of these studies indicate the same, who've taken a psychedelic in a certain situation have had profound, lasting change. Again, I go back earlier to this video. Even me, somebody who was regularly drinking alcohol, does ayahuasca, next minute, has a durable psychotherapeutic benefit of being repulsed by the very idea of consuming alcohol ever again. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm open in the future to resuming occasional consumption of alcohol, but right now, and for many years since I did the ayahuasca, I can't even think about doing it. It repulses me, and this is great. This is a big benefit for health. Admittedly, life is a little less fun, but my body is a lot healthier. Psychedelic neuroscience price tax. Some studies link psychedelics to an increase in functional connectivity across brain networks, and I just have to jump in here. From my personal anecdotes, I mean, no shit, Sherlock. As I mentioned earlier, when I'm stuck on a problem, I've tried everything else, I can't come up with a solution. Psychedelics have been very useful in helping in this area. And I believe part of the reason is because I'm able to make new connections in my mind, to find a new perspective. I think many others can relate. And that finding is consistent with synaptic density increasing in pigs after psilocybin administration. Yep, for those who don't know, pigs after taking magic mushrooms, in essence, more connections within their brains. Let that sink in. Of course, anyone who's taken psychedelics will probably go, well, duh. Psilocybin increased dendritic spine formation in the cortical neurons of mice, improving synaptic plasticity. Again, this is helping with neuroplasticity. This is science. This is not anecdote. This is the science. Early evidence suggests that the so-called psychoplastogenic effects of psychedelics can be linked to the psychedelic experience itself. Again, not only does the clinical evidence suggest this, but so does the anecdotal evidence of just about everyone who's ever taken a hallucinogenic. Notably, psilocybin administration has been correlated with a drop in blood flow to the amygdala, which governs fear and anxiety. Alpha rhythms are linked to perceptual processing in the posterior cingulate cortex, the reduction of which seems to result in ego loss during the acute psychedelic experience. Please let me know in the comments below if anyone themselves has experienced ego loss. Been there and done that repeatedly. And just for the record, I've actually induced this exact same state of complete and utter ego dissolution seven days into a 10 day intensive meditation retreat. There are multiple paths to get to this same place, although 100 plus hours of non-stop meditation, maybe high dose psychedelic, and this is almost guaranteed. This can be very unsettling for some people, liberating for many, and often both. Related work suggests that psilocybin disengages the default mode network, a brain network responsible for storing autobiographical information and understanding interpersonal relationships and perspectives on the past and the future. Just to translate this jargon, this tends to quiet some of the noise and the voice in the head. Further, the degree to which the default mode network resets seems to predict the response to treatment. Psilocybin's psychotherapeutic benefit relies on dose thresholds high enough to induce the reset of the default mode network. We're going to skip over this slide as well. Other studies find that psychedelics can increase unimodal transmodal crosstalk, or the compression of cortical hierarchy. Again, just to translate the jargon here, the research seems to show, and so does my own anecdotal experience, that psychedelics can allow new connections to form in the brain, new thoughts, new ideas, different parts of the brain that don't normally communicate or don't communicate much to become very active and engaged. This can help with creative thinking, problem solving, and so on. Another slide we'll skip over. Approval risks. The moratorium on psychedelic drug research between 1970 and 1990 delayed efforts to improve upon the pharmacological characteristics of the 5-HT2A agonists like psilocybin and DMT. Once again, dear war on drugs, f you. Approved drugs acting as 5-HT2A agonists versus antagonists. Again, if you want to nerd it out, please pause this. We're going to move on. Same instead of this slide, and this one, and this one, and here we go. The FDA's designations of psilocybin and MDMA as breakthrough therapies suggest that the tide is changing, though political dynamics still could become barriers to approval for many of these substances. And this is the biggest head scratcher in the entire article. We're looking at the different classifications of drugs. I'm sure most of you will understand. Schedule one is the worst. Schedule five, the least worst. According to the brain dead morons who make these decisions, LSD, MDMA, psilocybin, mescaline, and heroin have high abuse potential and no approved 
medical use. This is f***ing madness. Now, I personally believe heroin probably belongs in Schedule 1. As for LSD, MDMA, psilocybin and mescaline, these drugs showing incredible therapeutic benefit. Drugs with tens, if not hundreds of millions of anecdotal experiences. And as far as I'm aware, literally zero evidence of any high abuse potential. I mean, if anyone's ever taken LSD or psilocybin or mescaline, you'll understand. After your experience, you're not thinking, oh man, when can I do that again? You're thinking, holy f***, I've got to start making some changes in my life. I've done ayahuasca. Four ceremonies in the span of about 10 days. Haven't even considered doing it since. In fact, I haven't done any psychedelics for years. It's just absolute madness that these are still Schedule 1 substances. It's nuts. Schedule 2 includes cocaine, morphine, PCP, and meth. Yeah, methamphetamine. High abuse potential, but apparently approved medical use. I mean, guys, <laughs> it's absolute madness. Schedule 3 includes ketamine, anabolic steroids. Schedule 4, Xanax, Valium. I mean, what even is this? And Schedule 5, codeine-based cough medicines. It's just stunning. The FDA's approval of psilocybin today, a Schedule 1 classical hallucinogen, could reduce it to a lower schedule. F***ing well better. Potentially reducing the DEA's ability to prosecute those who possess or distribute it. It still does my head in, I mean, irrespective of the potential effects, rah rah rah. Psilocybin is found in, quote unquote, magic mushrooms. You can literally go pick a mushroom out of a piece of cow shit and then get arrested for picking a mushroom out of a piece of cow shit. I'm not even kidding. But hey, don't worry, go to the doctor, say you've got a slightly sore back and they'll give you plenty of opiates, no problems. Not like they're addictive and can ruin your life or anything. Another slide we'll skip over. And another, cost and time to drug approval. As we can see, there's an increasing trend here in both the cost of R&D and the average years to develop a new drug. It's now costing over $2 billion in R&D costs to develop a new drug and taking about seven and a half years. These things move very slow. In our view, psilocybin could provide incremental improvements in treating major depressive order, MDD, and treatment-resistant depression. Now, speaking anecdotally, I'm not someone who's personally suffered from depression or any of these type of mental health disorders. However, I know many people, friends, family, colleagues, and so on, who do, and from their own anecdotal experience, many of them have said, a mushroom trip, something along these lines, completely lifted that fog of depression, sometimes permanently, other times temporarily. I can't speak from personal experience, but the anecdotal evidence seems pretty clear. Psilocybin and many other psychedelics have major potential, especially in treating mood disorders, depression, anxiety, and so on. Business risks and prospects of psychedelics. In the United States, the cumulative economic burden associated with major depressive disorder, opioid use disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder in 2022 is around $1.4 trillion per year. Now, just jumping in here, that's a lot of money, but who gives a f about the money? How about the amount of suffering people are enduring as a result of this stuff? That's the real issue here. Just wanted to quickly run through this table. What we're looking at here is the cost, including indirect costs, direct healthcare costs, and the total burden, annual deaths, and so on, of these three major forms of suffering. Major depressive disorder, opioid use disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Just in the US alone, major depressive disorder causing almost 100,000 deaths per year. The same for opioid use disorder. Again, going back to the idiotic categorization, schedule one, schedule two, I mean, what the fuck? Opioid use disorder, nearly 100,000 deaths per year just in the US. Yet the big concern, LSD, MDMA, psilocybin. It's just fucking brain dead. 5,000 people per year dying in the US alone due to PTSD. Down the bottom here, and this is where I want to get to the investment point of view, pharmaceutical sales in the US alone, just for major depressive disorder, nearly $40 billion a year. Opioid use disorder, nearly $1 billion per year. And PTSD, $4.69 billion per year. And here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen. I personally believe the pharmaceutical companies today in the US alone doing about $50 billion in annual sales just to treat, and I use the term treat fairly loosely, these three mental health challenges aren't going to be particularly fond of psychedelic therapeutics given the potential efficacy and the, quote, durable effects. In other words, yeah, sure, you've got major depressive disorder. Here's your tablets. Here's your pills. Just take two a day every day for the rest of your life. Keep paying us money. We like that revenue. Mmm, delicious. Maybe do a couple of psilocybin-assisted psychotherapeutic sessions and you're done. No more recurring revenue. No more needing these pills every day for the rest of your life. No more ongoing cash flow for the pharmaceutical companies. Just wanted to flag this now. I expect we'll see some serious opposition from many of these pharmaceutical companies. These very reputable, highly ethical companies would never do anything wrong, so obviously it's not actually going to happen. There's definitely not going to be any actual opposition to these potential therapies. It's not like these companies would ever lie, mislead, deceive, be responsible for numerous deaths. No, they'd never do anything like that, would they? And if for some strange reason you want to look up fines and pharmaceutical companies in the United States alone and you see any evidence that suggests otherwise, 
you must be hallucinating. You better lay off those psychedelics, haha, <laughs> see what I did there? As depression becomes more severe, conventional treatments like SSRIs are much less cost effective. Only 20% of patients treated for MDD, major depressive disorder, respond partially without remission, while 50% do not respond at all. Clearly, especially in major instances of depression, today's pharmaceutical interventions are pathetic at best. 50% don't respond at all, and only 20% treated for MDD respond without remission. Clearly, today's interventions are not very effective, and that's being generous. Another one we're gonna skip over. According to early clinical evidence, psilocybin is more efficient and effective in the treatment of moderate to severe depression. The one-year depression relapse rate associated with psilocybin is roughly 2.5 times lower than S-ketamines. For those who don't know, derivative of ketamine. A picture is worth a thousand words, as is this chart. Relapse rates of antidepressant therapies one year after discontinuation. Notice, psilocybin here, maybe 20% of patients relapsing, in other words, classifying once again as suffering from depression. Lower relapse rate than any other intervention by a significant margin. SSRIs, about a 40% relapse rate, half as effective as psilocybin. Keeping in mind the psilocybin sessions, you might do maybe one or two per year and that's it, SSRIs every fucking day. TCAs, ECD, and S-ketamine, all significantly worse in terms of relapse rates. This is data, this is science, guys. This is an anecdote, although the anecdotal evidence points in the same direction. The efficacy of psilocybin, specifically treating depression, speak for themselves. Nothing else comes close. In clinical trials, the response rate to psilocybin has been five to 10 percentage points higher than the response to S-ketamine. And now, cost effectiveness of antidepressant therapy options. On the left, we've got annual costs. On the right, we've got response rate versus placebo. The further to the right, the more effective. And what do you know? Coming in as the most effective treatment, psilocybin in purple, significantly more effective than traditional antidepressants and esketamine. I'm gonna skip over this one as well. And this, there's some pretty nerdy stuff in here in these next few slides. Again, if you wanna check it out, this is really relating to the financials, the cost per depression-free day and so on. It's worth taking the time, but again, I don't want everyone to fall asleep. We'll skip across this slide as well. Now, one I do wanna focus on, we've got esketamine, psilocybin, and antidepressants plus talk therapy being compared. We've got the price, as we can see, psilocybin at this point in time, astonishingly expensive, $4,300 for the drug. The administration cost almost 12,000 US dollars. Over the quality of life change, psilocybin actually more cost effective than S-ketamine, less cost effective than antidepressants and talk therapy. However, I do want to underscore, antidepressants part of the major pharmaceutical machine and this doesn't take into account the efficacy and many people, in fact, I think the vast, vast, vast majority of people who take antidepressants stay on them for the rest of their lives. So you've got to take that into account as well. Given the current costs associated with S-ketamine, we believe payers would be justified in spending over $16,900 per dose on psilocybin therapy. Now, just wanna take a quick moment here to jump in. This, ladies and gentlemen, is why I'm so focused on accumulating capital for doing good in the future. This is not cost effective. Most people who are suffering from severe depression, addiction, and so on, different forms of trauma, just don't have $16,900 to spare, not even close to it. But these therapies are so effective. Let's skip forward. A price of $4,300 per dose, or $8,600 per year for psilocybin, not only would bring the cost per depression-free day down to $62, but would also bring the cost over quality of life to $100,000. Now again, this is good, this is a reduction, but it's still so incredibly expensive. At $4,300 per dose, ARC estimates that psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy could reach nearly 7.5% of patients with treatment-resistant depression, leading to $1.4 billion in revenue at peak sales within 10 years of commercialization. Again, I wanna jump in here. Reaching 7.5% of patients with treatment-resistant depression is great, but what about the other 92.5%? In short, they can't afford it. That could translate to a $5.5 billion, 10-year net present value for psilocybin sales for treating MDD and TRD in the United States alone. The data suggests that psilocybin has advantages in durability, safety, and efficacy relative to other treatment options for patients with MDD, major depressive disorder. Now, please take a moment to let this sink in. This wasn't just an advantage in durability in terms of the lasting effects. It wasn't just a benefit or an advantage in terms of safety. It wasn't just an advantage in terms of efficacy. All three of these are true. This is why the potential is so high and why I'm so passionate about these treatments. The CDC estimates that depression is a major cause of productivity loss among working adults and comes at a cost of 200 million workdays lost per year. Now we have ARC's projections for psilocybin sales in US dollars over time. Within 10 years, ARC Invest sees psilocybin sales exceeding 
$6.3 billion per year. We now have a table showing a few things in terms of the next 10 years of adoption. We've got psychiatrist adoption of psilocybin, number of psychiatrists, psilocybin patients, and total drug sales in millions of dollars USD in year one, all the way out until year 10. ARC expecting about 55% of psychiatrists adopting psilocybin as one form of treatment within 10 years. That would equate to almost 25,000 psychiatrists, which in turn would equate to over 200,000 psilocybin patients and total psilocybin sales as I mentioned earlier, of over $1.3 billion per year. That's up from $14.9 million 10 years earlier. If you're really bad at math, that's about a 100x increase. We projected that psilocybin sales could reach nearly $1.4 billion per year at a price of $4,300 per dose. However, and this is good news, this projection was made using conservative assumptions about patient eligibility and psychiatrist acceptance. While 1.4 billion might be a reasonable sales estimate for psilocybin as a treatment for treatment resistant depression, a more severe major depressive disorder, jumping in here, I find that extremely likely, as psychiatrists recognize its efficacy relative to SSRIs, which today represent a $15 billion market in the United States. Again, going back to the pharmaceutical industries, what do you think Big Pharma's gonna think about this? Psilocybin, $15 billion market in its crosshairs. I don't think the pharmaceutical company is gonna be super thrilled about this. The clinical data suggests that psilocybin is more effective. If psilocybin were to reach a similar blockbuster status at the price we think it can command, the peak sales implied within 10 years could be 3.5 billion dollars. Conclusions. In this article, we explored the therapeutic merits and investment prospects associated with psychedelics, specifically psilocybin. We hope that it is a useful starting point for investors interested in evaluating the space. While psychedelics have the potential to improve the way psychiatric conditions like MDD, TRD, PTSD, and OUD are treated, they also come with economic, regulatory, and health risks that should be considered carefully by investors, drug developers, and patients. Several factors could limit psilocybin's potential price, including competition from psilocybin retreat centers in places like Jamaica, competition from compounds with similar modes of action but shorter pharmacokinetics, like NN dimethyltryptamine, DMT, a lack of treatment infrastructure, and barriers to adoption associated with lingering cultural stigma, the latter of which I hope this video in a very small way may be able to help. In the coming years, ARC expects that scientists will continue to find new compounds that cause beneficial psychoplastogenic effects, Forthcoming breakthroughs should reveal more about the nature of psychedelic experience and allow clinicians to diagnose mood disorders more effectively while developing more effective and safe therapeutic agents. We believe psychedelics could usher in a new era of neuroscience in which the insights gleaned through functional neuroimaging over the last 20 years will be leveraged to solve some of the long-standing public health issues associated with mental illness. It's pretty clear that psychedelic therapeutics are showing incredible potential, especially in treating many mental health disorders. In turn, this can lead to the reduction and or complete alleviation of suffering for many, many hundreds of millions of human beings who suffer from these conditions. The tide is turning, the stigma is lifting, and things look very hopeful in the future. Now, as for the investment case in terms of psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy and psychedelics as therapeutics in general, I'm still not sold. Now, don't get me wrong, like ARK Invest, I'm expecting to see truly phenomenal growth in these therapies in the coming 10 plus years. The extreme efficacy, the durability of the effects, aka not a recurring revenue stream, the stigma, the controversy, the legal challenges and so on, I mean, this is gonna be a massive uphill battle. That being said, there'll be many successful businesses in this area, but I genuinely believe a lot of the heavy lifting will have to come from philanthropists. I also have a couple of questions I'd like to ask. If you've made it this far through the video, I'd love to know, does anyone watching have any personal experience with psychedelics in terms of treating these ailments, either as a trial participant or in a more casual setting? Is anyone watching currently suffering from any of the mental health disorders we've described in today's video? And now back to the point of philanthropy making a major impact in this area. In a since deleted tweet from Elon Musk referencing DMT, and for the record, it's not his only ever tweet on DMT, I shared this. Speaking of DMT, I think AI neural nets can be used to create new psychedelic compounds in the future and predict their effects, duration, etc. Kind of like AlphaFold, but for psychedelics. I think this is an untapped opportunity to do a lot of good. If any centimillionaires or billionaires are currently watching and you want to do this, I mean, save me the time and effort, get it done 10, 15, 20 years earlier, here's the idea. Please, go do it. If not, I'll get around to it myself. Funding this personally is currently the most likely use of my future Tesla stock gains. But 
I'd rather someone beat me to the punch as I'm a long way off having the necessary resources to do this. And I'm serious. If anyone watching has the capital, this could do more good, have a greater positive impact on a larger number of people than anything else I'm currently aware of. For those who don't know, psychedelics, often via psychedelic assisted psychotherapy across the board, are showing incredible potential to help people suffering from depression, addiction, PTSD, end of life anxiety, etc., for whom other treatments are ineffective. So, thanks for watching. I hope this video has opened a few eyes and got a few people thinking. And as I mentioned earlier, the topic of psychedelics is something I discuss extremely regularly over on Patreon, so if you're not already a member, click the card in the corner or the link in the pinned comment to join. As I mentioned, you can search by tag, click the psychedelics tag, you'll see every video I've ever posted where I discuss psychedelics. There's more than 30 of them. If you want to help move this research forward, I do highly recommend donating to maps.org. They really are pioneers in this field. And I hope to still be making videos on YouTube in a few years and decades time when these therapies are widely available and helping to reduce or completely end suffering for tens if not hundreds of millions of humans globally. I'm Stephen Mark Ryan, this is Solving the Money Problem, and has anyone ever wondered, why does that dickhead with three first names always say, I love you all, at the end of every f***ing video? That may have something to do with an insight or two I've gained while previously under the effects of psychedelics. I'm Stephen Mark Ryan, this is Solving the Money Problem, and I do love you all. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you want to support the channel and instantly unlock over 100 exclusive videos, plus my 10 year Tesla stock price targets and loads of other perks, including optional access to my Tesla valuation model, join our growing community of thousands of supporters on Patreon with the link in the pinned comment. You can also pick up some Tesla, Elon, and investment themed merch in the merch store. And if you're still watching, you're awesome. Please let me know your thoughts on today's video in the comments below and click the card on screen now to watch the next video.